Welcome to another lesson with Transparent Physics. This one is on uh, orbital weightlessness. And uh, weightlessness, I should immediately clarify, is that it's not actually weightlessness. So we'll talk about why I call it weightlessness if it's not actually weightless. And uh, a subtitle, be Beginner's Guide to Falling Forever. So this is going to be a... <laughs> I'm going to take a, take a sip of tea right now. This is gonna be <clears throat> a, uh, a fairly extensive video because this is, I think, a very challenging topic to understand. This is another one of those instances where we look at something, it makes completely, perfectly obvious sense to us what's happening, and then I have to tell you that uh, what you're thinking is wrong. So, let's might as well get started on it. Let's imagine that we have a video of astronauts floating around in space. Might have to use that as well. We've had to use that one time, which is a little bit scary inside of a spaceship using a ball peen hammer, but... Uh... Look back at me, look at me. How's she look? Kinda cold. And if I took a camera and a microphone up to 10 people on the street and asked them what they were looking at, most of them would probably say, well, they're floating because there's no gravity. And that makes sense as an answer. You know, we know that gravity pulls things down. If things don't look like they're being pulled down, then there must not be any gravity. And people know that if you get further away from an object, there's less gravity. So on the surface, it's a it's a reasonably smart thing to say. But let's test that idea a little bit. We've seen equations earlier in the unit where we can talk about the amount of acceleration due to gravity at a certain point, uh, at a certain distance, orbital radius from a given mass. And let's see how that calculation works out. So we have a, um, we're gonna imagine that we have a skyscraper and I'm just gonna patent this name. I should trademark this. So, uh, trademark, all right. Uh, skyscraper is a tall building. A sky piercer is a very, 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 very tall building. Thank you. Imagine that you've got a sky piercer that is tall enough that you could look out your window and see the International Space Station floating by. Uh, but it's at the same height you are. What would the gravity be there? Well, if we take a look at the calculations, and depending on where you're hopping into this series, this hopefully is a little familiar to you. Uh, the International Space Station orbits at a height of approximately 250 miles above the surface, but that's not the distance we use. We have to go all the way to the center of the Earth, so obviously this is not drawn to scale. Um, the Earth is around 600 or 6,400 kilometers in radius. Add another 400 kilometers in for the altitude. Altitude is the height above the surface. So our total distance is these two added together. So around 6,800 kilometers. Got to convert that to meters. Mass of the Earth. And then this equation is not too bad in the scheme of things. Put it all together. So that far away from the Earth's surface, how much will gravity have decreased? Would it be enough to account for the fact that it looks like things are floating? And the answer is unequivocally no. When you do the calculations, it ends up uh, giving you uh, 8.66 meters per second squared. So that, for all intents and purposes, really, your weight would not be appreciably different. So if you're going to go 250 miles above the Earth's surface to, to drop a couple pounds, um, that's literally all you're going to be doing is dropping a couple pounds. You're, you're, most of your weight is still going to be there. So if gravity doesn't decrease that much, what can we account for the floating and let's not forget too that um, the moon is orbiting the earth and the moon orbits much 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 further out than the earth does i mean than the uh, international space station does and there's still plenty of gravity there to keep the moon orbiting the earth so if there's plenty of gravity for the moon to orbit the earth uh, there's still plenty of gravity in space to to pull things downward 
uh, when they're in orbit around the Earth at the height that the International Space Station would be. So something is amiss. It seems as if things are floating, and uh, but there is still plenty of gravity at that height. So what can we do to account for this? Well, I'm going to frame this question in the context of something that I talked about in an earlier unit, and that's uniform circular motion. And specifically, we're going to look at one moment of that discussion uh, where an object is traveling in a circular path. And this is a vertical loop. And in the vertical loop, uh, it's spinning around. And at the top of the loop, we looked at a situation where there was nothing else acting on the object except for gravity. And that gravity needed to be enough to keep that object spinning around in a circle because the only thing pulling it towards the center was gravity. I feel, I feel that that is a um, reasonable approximation for what we're talking about here. The idea is that we have an object spinning in, let's assume a circular path. Let's assume it's uniform circular motion, so it's constant speed and constant radius. Not all orbits are like that, but honestly a lot of orbits are pretty close. So we've got a, a situation where it's just gravity pulling inward. Now in a vertical loop, like the one we talked about in the earlier unit, we're talking about one instant at the top where gravity is solely and exclusively responsible for keeping that object moving in a circle. That moment gets expanded across the entire circle in space because all the time in space, gravity is gonna be the only thing keeping that object in orbit. So that one single moment we talked about earlier, I think gives us insight into the entire experience when we're orbiting. And we talked about in that unit, the idea of how your centripetal acceleration compared to the G. And we knew that we were gonna have a certain amount of acceleration provided by G. And then we compared that acceleration to the amount that was required for the circle, A sub C the centripetal acceleration. And depending how the available acceleration compared to the needed acceleration, that determined what the object did. So we've got, um, in the first instance, uh, our circle. And the argument here is that if we are pulling with too much force, Then the object, <laughs> it's tough in my way on my table. All right, all right, if we're pulling with too much force, um, the idea is that instead of traveling in a circular path, it's gonna get pulled inward tighter radius. Uh, this is what happens when the acceleration provided by gravity is more centripetal acceleration than is required. So gravity is like, oh, I'm still pulling inward and the trace path or the uh, the path traced out by this dash line is what you would get for a given centripetal acceleration if the acceleration due to gravity is more than that centripetal acceleration it's going to pull inward on a tighter radius uh, the goldilocks situation if it's perfect We've got a circle traced out. And if the acceleration provided by gravity is the centripetal acceleration, then it does exactly what's expected. And we follow this nice circular path. You're just what I needed. Do, 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 do. Uh -oh. I don't want to get hit with a copyright strike though. All right, and then finally, what if it's not enough? Well, if it's not enough, then the object is going to move out in a larger circular path. Now, um, in this case, we are beginning to look at it from a gravitational orbit. Uh, and again, it depends on your circumstance. Um, I mean, if the string just broke here and it was a vertical loop, it would obviously fly out sort of straight and then gravity would pull it down. But we won't worry about the, you know, the complicated nuances there. For now, for the sake of this argument, we're just saying, hey, if there's not enough pull, 
you can't follow the circular path and you're going to end up going outward instead. Is there a force pulling you to the outside? No. There's just not enough force pulling you to the inside. So these are our three situations. And um, they're, they're very relevant for an orbital scenario. You can have a satellite that orbits perfectly. Right here. You can have a satellite whose orbit decays and it moves into uh, you know, closer to the uh, object it's orbiting. Uh, or you could have an object that uh, moves further out. Now this could be intentional or unintentional. Um, there's a lot of times when we have satellites and they have a, they get a boost uh, and they actually just really just need to increase their speed and they can move out to a further radius uh, for practical reasons. All right. Okay. So let's come back to Newton because Newton talks about lots of physics. So believe it or not, Newton had something to say about this. And he had a very, very famous, uh, what we have uh, come to know as Gedanken or thought experiment. The argument of a thought experiment is working through a scenario that, that might not be practical to um, conduct in, in person but you're working out logic. Now, again, you have to be worried. Yeah, not, you don't have to worry. You have to be cautious when doing thought experiments. It's not that we are using this as a surrogate for an experiment. We are simply teasing the logic out to different extremes and, and sort of seeing where it takes us. Let's follow Newton's logic in terms of what he was thinking about a cannon firing a cannonball. And for some reason, I will sometimes refer to a cannonball as a cannon. So let's imagine we have a cannon on top of a tall mountain, and it fires a cannonball, and we can continually increase the gunpowder of the cannon so that we can fire the cannonball at higher and higher and higher horizontal speeds. In the initial scenario, if we have the cannonball fired from a horizontal distance, um, above, you know, a, a consistent horizontal distance above the ground for reasons that we're not going to get into in this particular video, but uh, depending on where we are in the life of this channel, I'm sure I have a video about it somewhere, is the idea that if an object drops the same vertical distance, it doesn't matter how fast it's fired, it will take the same amount of time to hit the ground. Gravity doesn't care that you're moving horizontally and will accelerate you down vertically at the same rate and you will hit the ground at the same rate. So in this scenario, A, B, and C will all hit the ground at the same time because they're all dropping the same vertical distance. So Newton then said, well, let's take that situation a little bit further. Now you might have, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you learned something right there, but that's not what uh, the focus of this particular lesson is going to be. Next up, let's imagine that we scale it out a little bit. And instead of just firing it on what is effectively a flat area, if we can load the cannon with enough gunpowder that the curvature of the earth actually becomes an issue, what's going to happen? Well, you know, maybe uh, this is this guy over here. So this is still C. Okay. If we go D and we fire it even further, now the, the curvature of the earth is beginning to come into play. So this cannonball actually drops further than C did. D drops further than C, so D is gonna take more time. And then fire it even further, it takes even longer to hit the ground because it's the ground is effectively falling away from it as it drops. So if the ground is falling away from you as you drop, you're gonna take longer to hit the ground. So we have a scenario where depending on how fast we fire it, it's going to take longer and longer and longer to hit the ground. Now this, uh, we're ignoring air resistance also, by the way. Uh, this experiment, uh, air, air resistance would slow these things down rather significantly. Uh, but let's uh, continue from there. So Newton continues to imagine. He says, hey, what if I just keep firing that faster and faster and faster? Um, now, a little hard to see in my particular picture, but so the next time he fires it, it's kind of like and the next time he fires it, it's like and eventually 
he imagined a scenario where he fired it fast enough is that it's always going to be falling towards the earth it it never hits the ground because as it's falling the ground falls away from it uh, and you know this is an area we might effectively imagine that it comes back and hits the cannon back from the other side so in this scenario he is imagining that you could fire a cannon ball fast enough that it would never get any closer to the earth but it also would never get any further away so even though it's constantly falling towards the earth it doesn't get any closer and the reason for that is because the earth is curved and if you overshoot the curvature of the earth you can actually fall towards the earth but not get any closer it's like if you were in an elevator well not exactly like but a rough metaphor is if you were say jumped uh down an elevator shaft and the elevator was like eight feet below you uh but as you were falling towards the elevator uh, the uh, elevator dropped so that you were falling and it was falling it's not an identical situation because that's a straight linear acceleration and this has a circular component but uh, but the metaphor is good enough to for, for a quick conversation at least all right um now this scenario this perfect orbit so effectively what newton was proposing uh was the idea of a satellite now in his argument, you know, this is a cannon fired in the atmosphere. So this, this would never work. Air resistance would slow the cannonball down, and you, you'd never be able to achieve this. But in, uh, if we go above the atmosphere, where there is no air resistance, we can actually do this exact thing. This is how satellites work. But it only works under a very special set of circumstances. And you, you've got to have, for, for whatever your situation is, it has to be a perfect arrangement. This, this is a bit of a busy diagram here, but let's, uh, I can't really reveal this in pieces without losing some of it. So we're just going to, we're going to put the whole thing in camera at the same time here. If there was no velocity, the object would simply accelerate straight downward. If there was no gravity, the object would just fly off in this direction. But we can imagine a situation, now again, there's a myriad of other situations. There's a situation where there's a little bit of velocity and just hits the ground. There's a velocity where there's a little bit more velocity hits the ground here. There's a, a situation where there's too much velocity and just sort of flies off. Uh, but in one sort of perfect Goldilocks scenario for this situation, we have created a situation where it is starting with some velocity and falling but it's always falling in such a way that it's not getting closer to the earth. How is that possible? This only occurs if your satellite is traveling fast enough. And this is the big part here. The distance that it would fall in a given second, and I, and I propose that maybe it was this value right here. The distance that it would fall in a given second is equal to the amount that the earth curves away from the tangent during that same time period. The tangent to the curve is a straight line. So you can imagine at this instant, you know, if the if the ball was to go straight, okay, um, but instead it drops this distance. This is where it would go if there was no gravity. This is where it goes if there's gravity. So this distance here has to be the same distance that the Earth curves away from it at that time period, effectively. All right. So what we are looking to do. You imagine like you're, you're Superman or, or, or Supergirl flying, um, and you're flying and you see the Earth like below you. If you're flying fast enough and straight enough, you would actually see the Earth falling away from you because you're flying straight and the Earth's surface is curved. So that's you're getting an extra height every second. If we position the speed of a cannonball, such that that extra height that it would gain above the surface is equal to the distance it would fall, then it's not going to get any closer to the Earth. And that's how we get a stable orbit. Now, I'm spending a lot of time talking about, say, satellites and the Earth, but it's important to note that this information scales. So we could be talking, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be Earth and a satellite. It could be any of our uh, planets and a satellite. Uh, it could be the Sun and the Earth. 
the the earth is orbiting the sun in this exact same manner the earth has an orbital speed and that speed keeps it in its circle if the earth was to slow down the earth would end up getting closer to the sun if the earth was to speed up the earth would get further from the sun okay even on a galactic scale we have our not all galaxies do this but our our milky way galaxy has a has a big mass in the center and we are all, all of our um, systems in the Milky Way galaxy are orbiting that galactic center. We actually have the same rule applies, right? Our sun is just one satellite around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So this is really, I personally feel, the take home idea of this lesson, that you have to, ha you cannot orbit if you don't have a certain amount of speed. And again, sometimes I'll say orbital velocity. It's, that's not really the right answer because velocity uh, indicates a certain direction as well. And when you have an orbital speed, it's constantly changing direction to go around the circle. Pardon me when I say the wrong word. But this is, uh, I think, the, the main idea. Your speed has to be fast enough so that you overshoot the curvature of the Earth by the exact amount that you would fall during that same period of time. And if you can make that happen, you're in good shape. All right, so let's uh, let's head to the last column here. This is a this is a big lesson, but it's a hard concept, so I wanted to cover a little extra content to this to try to drive it home. All right, so that was more of a conceptual argument to all this. At this point now, I want to try to bring it in with a slightly more mathematical approach. Again, sometimes the concept works for you, sometimes the math works. Hopefully both of them in concert is what we need to make sure we have the idea down perfectly. So, um, in order to get a stable satellite, you need to match whatever acceleration is available there. And we've shown you equations with orbital speed uh, and orbital period where you have a distance from the object in orbital radius, uh, you've got a mass of the central object, and really what it comes down to is the orbital speed and radius of a satellite are constrained to the acceleration provided by gravity from the central mass. And we've had an equation for little g. Little g tells us the acceleration available at a certain orbital radius from that object. That g is your centripetal acceleration. That's what's going to be spinning the object around. And that's all you have to work with. So your satellite, if it wants to have a stable circular orbit, has to use that acceleration provided by the gravity. If your acceleration, um, or let's, if, the, if the speed defined by that acceleration is too much, uh, well, you may not leave orbit, but you're going to leave the orbit that you were in and move to a further out orbit. Uh, in theory, you could actually leave orbiting the object entirely. If your velocity is too slow, uh, you're actually going to move towards the object. And this, this happens, this is something people have to worry about if you have a satellite in space. Um, the Earth's atmosphere doesn't perfectly just drop off. It, it attenuates as you get further and further and further from the Earth. And... If your satellite is orbiting at a certain radius, and uh, you know maybe it just uh, you know the orbit decays a little bit, or the the atmosphere heats up some and, and goes out further than you had calculated for, uh, when you start hitting more air than you calculated, your your satellite's going to start actually slowing down. And if your satellite starts to slow down, it's going to go deeper into the atmosphere. And if it goes deeper into the atmosphere, it's going to hit more air. And if it hits more air, it's going to slow down even more. So you can have an, a satellite that, that rapidly decays. Uh, and when satellites are done with their functional uh, lifespan, uh, a lot of times they are deliberately decommissioned that way. They are slowed down, slowed down, and uh, they re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. And that's um, a pretty good way to handle it, assuming it burns up in the atmosphere, because then we have fewer things floating around in space for other things to bump into. So it's a little bit of a cleaning off your plate when you're done kind of thing. But let's see. Uh, if I'm going to make that argument, then we're going to have to take an object and show that the acceleration that it 
travels at is equal to the uh, acceleration. The centripetal acceleration of its motion is equal to the gravitational acceleration provided. So let's go back to the space station. We started off this lesson with that, with that guy. And when we do the math, this is the orbital speed of the International Space Station, courtesy of Wikipedia. This is the orbital radius. We already talked about it. Now, instead of solving for g, we're going to solve for the centripetal acceleration. And what do we have? ac equals v squared over r. And take a look at that. 8.65. Within rounding, for all intents and purposes, that is the same value that we calculated at the start of the lesson. 8.66. So this is the acceleration provided by gravity for this setup. This height orbital radius and this mass and by no small coincidence um, the centripetal acceleration that the International Space Station is going to exhibit is that exact amount within rounding okay the gravitational acceleration at your orbital radius constrains what makes a stable orbit now, that is the math aspect of it, but we haven't, I don't necessarily focus yet on the question we started with, and the idea is why do astronauts in orbit uh, appear to float? Why is that the case? Well, the argument is that they are falling. I feel like, all right, there we go. Um, they are falling and everything else around them is also constantly falling. So, Let's think of a situation where you're in the elevator. You're in the elevator this time. You're not jumping down the elevator shaft onto the elevator. If the elevator started to fall, you and everything in it would be falling at the same rate. Now, generally speaking, we get a sense of our weight by us pressing against the surface. So if the surface is falling at the same rate you are, you're never going to press against it. You're not going to feel your weight. Right? If there was a scale, it wouldn't show anything because it would be accelerating with you as well. So, for as long as the elevator was in free fall, you would feel like you're floating. Um, does that mean gravity's not pulling on you? No, gravity's the reason you're falling in the first place. But if everything is falling with you, it seems that you are weightless. And this is what's happening in orbit. <clears throat> a, a, well, let's, let's look at a couple similar situations and see if we can tease things out, because I think people get a little confused on, on this topic. So we'll start with the item that we are discussing right now, orbital weightlessness. And in that situation, you are falling because of a pull due to gravity. Now in orbit, Gravity is going to be a little bit less, but not necessarily that much less if you're you know, in, a, in a sort of a regular satellite orbit. But you and the environment around you. So this is your space station or, or whatever it is. These are your tangerines and other stuff. Everything is accelerating downward. But because everything is accelerating downward with you, it, it seems as if you are floating. This experience, elevators, uh, falling down elevator shafts maybe isn't the best way to do it. But you can also get this experience in an airplane. Uh, the airplane will go up, take like a parabolic path, and then drop. Uh, as the airplane begins to drop, it's effectively in a controlled freefall, and everything inside the plane begins to sort of float around. It's not that it's floating, it's not that gravity's been canceled, it's that everything is falling at the same rate. Everything's accelerating downward at the same rate. So, we can use this to simulate weightlessness in space, orbital weightlessness, because it's the exact same thing. We're not actually really simulating it. It's, it is the exact same thing that you'd be experiencing in space. So when astronauts are getting trained for, to get that sensation of weightlessness, and you've probably seen videos of this too, um, they'll be floating around on the inside of this big airplane. And that is the same 
scenario, the same experience, because they are effectively falling. Now, that might last for 20, 30, 45 seconds. In space, it lasts for weeks or, or months, depending on how long you're up there. And uh, fun fact, also, the uh, the classic movie Apollo 13, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Bill Paxton, Kevin Bacon, those scenes in the Apollo um, capsule where they are floating around and tossing each other wrenches and and all those scenes where it looked very realistic how they were floating around weightless in space, it's because they were in an airplane that was falling down towards the ground. So there's probably some neat documentaries of that available too. Really, really clever way to film those scenes. Uh, but it's entirely the experience that you would have if you were an astronaut as well. So I call this orbital weightlessness, but again, I put orbital... I mean, really, I should put weightlessness in quotes, not orbital, because it's, it's not really weightlessness. It's, it, it is... You have your weight. You've got gravity acting on you, so it's not weightlessness at all. <clears throat> now, in comparison, let's imagine somebody who's in uh, free fall with air around them. Now, this is not the same thing as this. Now, gravity is acting on both objects. But in this case, let's assume the person's falling fast enough that they've reached terminal velocity. So the air resistance acting on them equals their weight such that their velocity is now constant. Now, in this case, you're, again, it's downward pull of gravity is the same. Here, the forces are unbalanced. You are accelerating downward. If, if you weren't accelerating, you don't get circular motion. Circular motion is constantly being accelerated. In this case, we are not accelerating. We've got a constant velocity. This is not the same thing. You, here, you're going to feel a force pushing up on you. Here, you don't feel anything because there's no force pushing up on you. All right. Um, also, so this person, now this person could be floating if you've ever seen a video of an indoor skydiving park. It's one of those things where you've got a giant tube and they push air up on you from below and then you float around inside of a tube. Now that floating is not the same floating as this floating. This floating is because you've got a force acting up on you that balances the force acting down on you. This floating is because you're not actually floating, you're falling. But everything's falling with you, so, you know, whatever. Not the same thing, although a casual observation might think they are very similar to each other. And then, finally, <clears throat> we would have true weightlessness. Now, true weightlessness... Um, to the best of my knowledge, no human has ever experienced true weightlessness at this point because that would require you being far enough away from uh, an object that it, the, uh, the experience of its gravity is, is, is non-significant. And um, I, I'm going to take dibs on this right now. Uh, YouTube, back me up on this. Uh, I'm going to call this... You know, at, when, when we get to a point where we're far enough away from everything that there is no significant gravitational attraction. Now, gravity acts over huge, huge, huge distances. So you're never going to be totally free from gravity. But we could imagine a situation where you're just totally, totally far enough away from all kinds of things that there is no significant force of gravity on you. And you are literally floating because there's nothing pulling you down in any particular direction. I am going to declare this to be the Wienan myers threshold. Um... So everyone else has to use that now whenever we reach that. Whenever we reach a point where there's no effect, no effective gravity acting on you from any source. The Wienan Myers threshold. Uh, Mr. Wienan was my chemistry teacher in high school. He was super cool. And the reason I de uh, decided to become a teacher. And Mr. Myers was my physics teacher the year afterwards who taught me lots of cool physics. And he's the reason that I became a physics teacher. So Mr. Wienan's the reason I'm a teacher. Mr. Myers is the reason I'm a physics teacher. So the Wienan Myers threshold. There we go. Dibs. I called it. So at this point, uh, it would probably be appropriate for me to go and review everything we talked about. But it's a YouTube video. And if you want to review it, um, you can probably do so easily on your own. And this video is probably long enough as it is already. So instead, for your viewing pleasure, I have instead drawn you a picture of the first space-born capybara. So uh, at some point in the future, NASA will bring uh, large semi-aquatic rodents into space. If you don't know what a capybara is yet, please look it up on YouTube. Um, they are 
they are charming creatures so this has been a very long video probably and there is a lot of content in here but if you stop and you think about it as is many of the cases in introductory physics the initial easy answer the idea that astronauts are floating because there's no gravity um, we see that when we apply some physics to it it can't be true and then the challenge is to continue to apply physics to get to the point where we understand what's actually happening so i appreciate you taking the time to stick with me through this lesson and i hope we've made things a little clearer for you with transparent physics